Perfect. All right, everyone. We went a little bit ahead of my slides here. So let me, I don't know why they always- hey, wait. No, no, Avery went to work for spring, not me. You're mixing us up again. Oh, wait, can I get a screenshot of that? No, hold on a second. I knew I was getting hold something. On. All right, <laughs> all right, yeah, I know. Well, I'm sending that to Keith. <laughs> Send that to Keith, please. All right, everyone. Welcome, uh, welcome to one of our last uh, masterclass series of this year. We might have one or two more, we're still confirming, but we have saved the best for last, I will say, um, with Ian Fisker Mental Capital Network. But until, I'm gonna present him in a second, but I would like to go over you know, who we are as communities.org and what we do first. But welcome to this iteration of our masterclass series, Attributes of Successful Startups. So we are, um, a growing team, usually I say small but mighty, but now we're a wonderful growing team from all over the world, um, remote. And so if you guys have any questions about how to manage and grow a remote team, uh, please let us know. Ian as well can also speak to this. Um, Sarah Joy is based in, in Colorado. I'm based in Guatemala City. Ray is currently in Germany. Missy's in Utah, Rena and Colin are in Canada, and TJ is in Colorado. So who are we? What do we do? Super quick, um, I would say our, our work falls into two buckets. One is our membership community, which is a global community of purpose-first conveners. And what does that mean? Um, our definition of a convener is any individual or organization that's committed to bringing others, other people or organizations together to create some sort of actionable, sustainable impact. So that could look like an impact accelerator incubator. It could look like an impact investor, a philanthropic organization, a corporation um, focused on social environmental impact. It could look like a um, digital storytelling services, coaching, leadership development, you name it. Those are conveners. Um, and we have uh, at least one member, two members, well, with Ian, two members um, of Commuters.org on the call, Eklund Green and Mentor Capital Network. And then our other bucket of work is one-on-one -on -one consulting services, which we call advisory services. So this is for um, really any organization, but in the past, we've really focused on working with philanthropic organizations, corporations, and universities um, to help them in their convening needs. So please uh, let me know if you guys have any questions about joining our community or about advisory services. And with that, I'm going to present Ian, who has been part of the Commuters.org journey since the very beginning. So we're always happy to have him present on his plethora and dynamic and expansive knowledge and expertise. But today we're going to be focusing specifically on the data that he's been collecting over 30 years, Ian, how many years? <laughs> this particular data set is the 10 year slice. So this is slice. the okay. 2008 to 2018 slice, which we picked before COVID, which is good because it would have been difficult to do some of these. How do you determine if a company was successful that started in 2019 and required customers to leave their homes? That seems kind of unfair. Um, yeah, exactly. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing so Ian can share his screen and I'm gonna pass it off Ian and this is a you know we really do want this to be participatory so if you have questions Ian uh, do you prefer raise hand unmute chat mixture um, just let us know but we'd uh, love chat, to um, particularly because yeah. uh, I, I can never see the raised hand unless you're the host there's always a okay. um, and there are break points in what I'm doing for uh, for questions so but you can ask at any time um, can you, is the, is your, are you just looking at a PowerPoint presentation? Yes, just the slide. Yes, 30 years of technical expertise in PowerPoint, not my thing. Okay, uh, so the Mentor Capital Network, we support early stage for-profit entrepreneurs. Uh, early stage can be idea, it can be prototype, it can be expansion, um, whose environmental, social, or cultural values are built into how they make their money. So if you're Kicking a percentage to charity, personally applaud you. Professionally, we don't care because we're looking for companies that will serve as models for other companies. They will do things that will make the world a better place and still make money. And other people say, oh, I can do that. Um, and we do this, our value add, our principal value add is we match these entrepreneurs with mentors who have dealt with similar challenges but are not competing for the same customers. Many cultures uh, have some version of the phrase, when you solve a problem, you're rewarded with a more interesting problem. When I write academic papers, I have to call these second order effects. My preferred term is better devils. I forget who told me that, but that's one version of it. 
so we try and find people who know what the entrepreneurs are going through and who know not to tell them what to do, but to give them questions to ask. We do that by having 15 to 20 people review a business plan and be on some video calls during the review process, because what we want is the entrepreneur and the mentor to choose each other. Our process involves, I've been doing mentoring work for 25 years, and I can tell you that finding people the right skill set is easier than finding two people who want to connect and support with together. We are in essence running a dating agency, not the romantic kind, but we're getting two adults who are not getting paid to want to spend time together. So our, our pool of 1,200 folks around the world are all volunteers, except for me and a handful of central team. Um, and so by using the document review, we, get a, we, we allow them the, the entrepreneurs to say, this person was helpful to me in a way that works for me. And by using the document review, more than 8,600 so far, um, short of, say, for example, Equin Green, that's probably a, a lot of the data, more data than most of the folks in the field have. It's a lot of data. This is the story of that data. Um, what do we mean by mentoring? So the other thing I have learned, the two big principles are compatibility is harder to find than skills. And the other is never use the phrase, do you want to be a mentor? Because your answer, says the great psychic, is I'd love to, but I'm really busy. What do you mean? We happen to ask folks, uh, can you read two business plans in the month of October or whenever it is, to which will either say yes, no, we're asking in October. Other programs have different approaches, but mentoring is such a wide term in English, particularly, that we, we try and give folks a real focus on what we mean by it. Uh, we create ongoing relationships. And one of the things we've been proudest of is that we have brought in hundreds of people who did not think of themselves as mentors before they worked with us. When I was first sort of building this about 15 years ago, I looked around and most of the mentoring programs were folks who had made a lot of money in Silicon Valley or somewhere. And yes, they're useful, but they're not the only set of folks with applicable use. All right. The mentees, as mentioned, folks have integrated their social values. Here's some examples. I'm sure several of these folks have also been Equin Green Fellows. I think I know at least two of them have. Um, our, the best point for us is folks who are passionate about their expertise. They're good at their craft. We can't help you make a better solar operation or water filter or recycled plastic or whatever, but we can help you build a business around it. Um, we're global. We've had folks in almost 100 countries, hoping for the 100th this cycle. And uh, our entrepreneurs reflect the world that we draw them from. We work in English, Spanish, or French. So our entrepreneurs are 70% non-white, which is not necessarily a diversity outreach. That's just what the world looks like in the languages in which we operate. Um, and our alumni companies are 49% women-led or co-led. OK. That's interesting. The graphic there, doesn't matter. The best time to plant a tree is 10 or 20 years ago. We did that. The questions that we are looking at, that we will get through some of these, is one, how can we collect the information we need in a way that's useful to the entrepreneurs and mentors we serve? Sending out endless surveys doesn't really work. The, the collection has to have value. What aspects of a business plan are most important to a company's eventual success? Some folks tell me we don't write business plans. That's fine for you, but in order to get use 20 people to find the two people who become the mentor, we need some kind of engagement and interaction. And having all 20 have one-on-one -on -one conversations with the entrepreneur won't work for the entrepreneur's schedule, won't work for the mentor's schedule, certainly won't work for our schedule. So we use document review. It's what we do. Um, what attributes of the startup team are correlated to success? And what kinds of people are best able to predict the eventual success or failure of an early stage company? A little bit on methodology. Um, like I said, we've done more than 8,600 reviews. We took a 10 year slice. We stopped it in 2018 because we wanted to give it a couple of years to determine if the companies were actually successful. Um, so that's 7,600 reviews, more than 1,000 people, 773 distinct companies. What is success? We would love to track the social and environmental goals, but we are industry agnostic and global. So the success of an agricultural co-op in India 
and a healthcare startup, tech startup in Myanmar and an LED firm in Chicago are not easily cross-tabbed with each other. The four measures that we use are, we use them frankly, because they're the ones we can find. They're the ones for which we have information on for almost all of our companies. Years in business since they came through our program, revenue, funds raised, non-founder hires. Uh, we get this through the companies, through interviews, through the usual Crunchbase, Owler, and Pitch Deck. Uh, it should be noted, if you're familiar with Crunchbase, Owler, and Pitch Deck, they're mostly useless. Particularly Pitch Deck annoys me because you pay 10 grand for it and the data is not any better for startups. I'm sure for bigger companies, they're more useful. But the way we found it useful is if you send an email every year or so to your massive number of alumni saying, how are you doing? What are you doing? And you didn't give them, for example, $100,000, so they're less prompted to reply, it says to the equity rate audience member. Um, the, uh, you get much better response if you say, according to this public database, you have this much in revenue. People are far more likely to correct or update bad information than they are to just give you information. So that's what those are good for. So some of our charts are average revenue, they're basic numbers. Some of those charts are what we call over under representation. Um, yeah, sorry, the boring stuff first, but you're gonna see a lot of data, so we're gonna do it this way. Um, which means that what percentage of people are over or underrepresented in the top or bottom 10% of the category referenced? The reason we do that is some of our companies have raised or earned hundreds of millions of dollars. They are not necessarily dramatically more successful than the companies that have raised or earned millions. They're just in a financial field or they're in a field where cash is a bigger player. There are social enterprises that have a smaller amount of money that maybe even a break even, but have done massively positive things. Um, so we had to take out the outliers. Remember our most successful company, Tala, is a half a billion dollar shop. They entered our program twice. And then, you know, there's the, the handful of, significantly large companies like Runa and Back to the Roots and a couple of other in that sort of vein. But uh, so what we did is when we say this attribute is overrepresented in the top 10%, what that means, for example, just to make the math easier, if we had a thousand companies and 200 of them were led by mixed gender teams, we would expect 20 mixed gender teams in the top 10%. If instead they were 35, we would record that as 185% overrepresentation. It's nerdy, but it's more accurate than doing average revenue because when you're in different industries in different countries, we can allot for like average income in Myanmar versus US, but outside of that, we use a UN wealth factor for different countries, but outside of income, like there's not much we can do. So we do this. And as mentioned, just asking people a whole lot of questions doesn't get you a lot of answers. So these review forms help the mentors and the entrepreneurs choose each other, provide feedback on business plans. Each plan get each person entrepreneur gets uh, about 30 or 40 pages of feedback for each cohort. Not total, not per reviewer, in case any of you were thinking of reviewing, don't be scared. Uh, and one of the favorite things we got to do is the reviewers got to see the feedback of the other reviewers. This is really what jumped us up from a local to a global program. About 10 years ago, we started sharing the feedback on the same companies. So smart people got to see what other smart people with deliberately curated different backgrounds had to say about interesting ideas. And our investor and foundation partners get unbiased expert perspectives on these companies. And we're not going door to door and doing proper true due diligence from a financial point of view, but we're getting smart people who know the industry to look at the company, so that, that helps. And quite frankly, this is the best business education ever. I have read every single one of these. I make myself copy edit them so that I have to read them. Um, not that I wouldn't want to. There's just you know, 40 pages times 20 companies times every couple months. It's a lot of reading, but I do it. Best business education ever. Okay. So that's a bit on methodology. Any questions about what we're working with and what we did? Yeah, this is the boring bit. Don't worry, I know. But I, I need to lead with this because process. Huh. So apparently none of the graphics are showing up. Oh, what a PowerPoint. Um, reviewers, our review form has these questions on it. We've been asking the same questions since 2008. Our form has not changed. 
The text of the mission question has changed a little bit, but we don't use that a lot in the data because that's not really a success metric track. Um, I want to change some of the questions sometimes, and we add new questions as a funder or other partner might request, but we always have these core questions so that that's why we have this massive data set. These questions, as you might know, are pretty basic. Pretty much every, some version of these questions are asked by pretty much everybody who does what we do. Right, like the, the basic. Okay, now we get to the first of the charts. Is this all showing on everybody's screen? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so when I talked earlier about representation, this is one of those charts. So, over representation, so we looked, so remember those seven categories, which are listed here product, market, risk, team, financials, overall. And we took the top 10% performing uh, scoring companies in each of those categories. And we compared how much better they did because in almost all cases, they did better because these were the top performers by category to see if there were any clear delineations. Um, and we compared this to the full set average is all 773 companies. And then these are the average. So I put the numbers in in case people want to see numbers, but the percentages to me are actually a more accurate approach from a statistical point of view. Yes, I'm a giant nerd. Um, so some of the things we learned, uh, risk, we have a risk question. Risk is almost irrelevant. The score assigned on a company's risk assessment on the upside to a company's success. Risk is highly relevant, as it turns out, to the downside. So if you have a low risk score, you're almost certain uh, statistically to fail. Um, what that tells me is there's not a lot of innovative ways to do risk assessment, right? Looking at almost a thousand of these, people do a solid risk assessment because that's the baseline. What are the possible SWOT? What are the competitors? But you don't see a lot of innovation in how, what the risks might be. Because if there's not, there's not like a better way to do risk assessment that shows up in a business plan. Um, but things like product and market, if you are really good at describing your product or describing your market or customer base, that is a significant difference. Oops. Uh, compared to the other companies in terms of your eventual revenue, not in terms of your funds raised, though there's, we have thoughts on that. But so companies that are really good at defining their market and defining their product are far more likely, three times, almost four times more likely to be significantly successful in their business plan. Um, team, I used to think team was the most important thing. Um, and we, we encourage folks to describe not just who's working there, like, like the resume page of who, who, who's on our team is the, is the same thing as risk. Like there's a standard way to develop it. But who are your future roles? One of the things I can still tell when I read a business plan if they've done a company before, is that they, 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 they know who they're, not the roles they're going to hire for, not the people, but the roles. Um, and so the difference between revenue and revenue adjusted uh, is we took the UN's average national income, you know, UNDN, some letter, set of letters, and we we uh, multiplied it again. So the US was a 1.0. So in countries like Liberia and, and Myanmar, $100,000 or, or CLO, $100,000 means a lot more than $100,000 in the US. So we multiplied the revenue numbers and um, we did not do that for funds raised because the funds raised mostly came from the US or Western Europe or Singapore or Australia. Um, so the source of the money is more relevant to us. Like if you're selling into Myanmar, that doesn't count. If you're based in and selling from Myanmar, that's what we're looking for, or CLA or Liberia, whatever. Um, so when you see the, see the higher numbers for revenue adjusted, that means that a company that made a you know, million dollars a year as Liberians operating in Liberia was given out an adjusted score significantly higher than the same company in the US because a million dollars means a lot more there. If they're selling, if they're based in and their customers are in, if they're based there and they're selling to Europe or the US, then we didn't adjust because it's about the money the customers have. Um, so this tells me that a well-regarded plan from an in, from a non-US company has the strongest correlation to eventual success. 
which makes a lot of sense because particularly for some of these places, connections are what get a business launched. And uh, as uh, many people have said a variation of, you know, uh, talent is mostly equally distributed, opportunity less so. And so if you're in San Francisco or New York and you can't find the people we can introduce you to, that's less your, our problem than yours. But if you're in Oklahoma or Vienna, we add more marginal value. Um, any questions about this? Um, could you, maybe you said this, but could you explain what the scores and team measure again? So there are these categories in our review form. And the categories ask the reviewers to uh, comment on the team and then give it a one through five score. We used to be a competition. We stopped being a competition about 12 years ago because we didn't feel like that added value, but we kept the scoring for this project. So say you review a plan and you looked at the team section or lack thereof in a business plan and you were asked to score it uh, one to five, five being the best. And we give examples of what, you know, one, two, three, four, five might be. Um, and then what we did here is we compared it to the average of all of the 773 companies, how well they did. Um, and then we took the top 10% of those scores, which were a, um, let me tell you, actually. Yeah, well, it's too complicated to screen. Um, so on a one through five for team, I think it was something like the top 10% were anybody over a three nine, right? And then we looked at how within those, uh, how much better were those top 10% than the overall average? Why is this relevant? Relevant? Uh, relevant? Because that means, was this section of the business plan an indicator of future success? So if the answer for risk was no, unless you, got it, unless you did it badly, in which case it was an indicator of failure. The answer, so what you're looking for are numbers in excess of say 250%, because they're gonna be better because it's the top 10% anyways. But if they're dramatically better, that means that that section is what people is the, the fact that they have defined that section, whether they're using it as a marketing document or an operations document, or hopefully both. Uh, then that indicates that it's it's uh, more about that people get that right, think that through, are more likely to succeed. Um, although there's a little, I have a, I, I'm less product like everybody gets product right because it's their thing. I use market and team often as a test of have people done this before, do they know what they're doing? But that's me, but this is the data. Is that questions, that make sense? Uh, another way to present roughly the same data, um, variance of category score to eventual success. So we took our four success measures, we created a one through five formula that sort of averaged them compared to the average score that everybody received on said long complicated math. Um, basically we created a success score where the average success score of all of our companies was their average overall score. Um, and then we mapped, we did, we did the statistical variance. So lower numbers are better. So the higher the success score, the closer. So, uh, a high financial score was more likely to meet success. Uh, risk is, is correlated because this counts both success and failure. So it's the same data in a different way. I don't know why the pictures aren't showing up, but okay. Um, all right, hold on a second. I am gonna, I'm worried that I'm missing stuff. Uh, hold on a second, one quick second. No, I'm not missing anything. That's weird. The things just disappeared. Oh, I must have, when we were playing around, I must have killed all the graphics. Okay. Mm -hmm. you're, see, you're seeing the, uh, seeing it again? No, we see, I see a document that says the built yard story over doc. Uh, ah, yeah, I know what that is. All right. Um, sorry. 
Mm-hmm. What do you get now? Presentation and beginning of presentation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do we do about failure? The graphic here has a flip side. Um, it's harder to map common trends for the companies that did poorly because mostly they disappeared or they didn't stay enough in business long, for, long enough for us to get data. Um, risk and team scores are the most accurate assessment of a company that's going to fail. Um, the few numbers we do have come from a few companies that we badly underestimated. Um, and what is slightly embarrassing for me, the company that we gave the single lowest scores to that went on to do the best was run by a guy who I used to work for in college. So sorry, Ross. Um, okay. Um, reviewer. All right, so any questions about that? I'm going to open another version of this so I can see and tell you what's on. Hold on a second. Hi. Yeah, you know, it's a slide master thing. Okay, never mind. When we were messing with them, my multiple screens from getting, we killed it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I know what it says. So I know what it does. Okay. So when looking at um, the reviewers, it is of great interest to us, both for our own program and for a lot of the folks we talk to is what reviewers, what are the attributes of reviewers who are able to spot companies that do well or do poorly? Um, and we look at their education level, their background, since race is on here. When we say race, we mean we are aware that this person is part of a large and public dominant or non-dominant group in the region where, where they live and work. Doesn't fit on the spreadsheet, so we say race. However, we are not comfortable making those assessments outside of the United States because you know, we have Nigerian entrepreneurs who are being reviewed by other Nigerians. There's probably a class distinction, but we don't know it well. So we only, the tag in some of the things going on forward is only for the US because it's not, we're not making judgments about cultures that we're not experting. Um, we're also trying to quantify people's perspective. That means if you have a medical degree, I know that it matters. Are you a researcher, a general practitioner, a field medic, or a public health specialist? Because it's how you use the education that really matters. But we haven't yet figured out a way to algorithm that yet. So we're working on it. All right. So looking at the characteristics of the entrepreneurs. Um, as alluded to before, mixed gender teams twice as likely to be successful, 185% close enough, as all male and all female teams in the, all four of the success categories. Like this is the single biggest um, delineator is if your team, is, and uh, we don't, we're doing all male, we're doing, it's binary at the moment because we have a handful of non-binary folks, but there are not enough non-binary folks to make to be of statistical significance. I assume in the future we will have a chart, but three is not a number from which I can derive useful information. Um, 200, 400, 700, or 500, whatever these numbers are, that's when I look them. Um, all female teams slightly perform to all male teams, except for longevity, for some reason. Um, entrepreneurs between the ages of 26 and 29, when they were starting their companies, 75% more likely to, to raise outside funding. We think this is because uh, for our first 10 years, we worked heavily in partnership with Net Impact. 
which means that a lot of the folks we saw of that age were just coming out of business school. So they were right when they had the most contacts. As entrepreneurs get older, there is a decline in the, uh, the age at which they start the company, not while they're running the company. There's a decline in this, all the four success measures. It is much more, this will surprise nobody, certainly not the two women, it is much more dramatic for female entrepreneurs. So females in their 20s are almost on par with men. Once you get over 30, when the, at that age when you're starting a company, they are dramatic, they're one third as likely to be successful as the male entrepreneurs statistically in our sample set. I am gonna make a, just a wild guess that this has something to do with the people they're raising the money from and not as much them, but uh, that's just something that is borne out. Um, the educational background doesn't, for the entrepreneur, doesn't matter that much. Um, doctorates are much more likely to raise funds, although that's because almost all of our folks with doctorates were in technical fields that their companies were in, right? That's not because. My assumption is they're in the industry. They know the contacts, they're deep. Um, much to my amusement, the least useful advanced degree is the MBA. It wasn't harmful, it just wasn't that helpful. Um, uh, okay, so this is the, uh, the piece on, uh, we looked at all the companies and we, you know, we did the representation in the top 10%. And as you can see, mixed gender knocks it out of the park. Um, and the others, uh, the all-female is slightly better than the all-male, but uh, apparently if you're gonna start a company, and you want, uh, you want the best correlation to eventual success, have, uh, have a mixed gender leadership team. This is the age data. Um, this is for both or all genders, I guess. Um, we, uh, interestingly, for some folks, we had an age unknown. We didn't know how old they were and they tended not to do very well, which would, which makes sense to me because those are the people, the successful companies, we know a lot about them because we can find them. Some of our companies were global. They start in places, they drop off the internet, they don't, don't answer their emails, we can't ever find them again. And those are the, those are the folks there. Um, but you can see here for all, for men and women, getting right out of business school is apparently the optimal time to start, or the age thereof is the optimal time to start a company. And here's what I call the Hollywood problem. Uh, that uh, well in their 20s, men and women, uh, actually women do slightly better, but there is a huge drop off. Um, so, you know, for every Meryl Streep, there's a half a dozen Harrison Fords. That's why I call it the Hollywood problem. Um, again, I'm assuming this is about the outside society. I don't know. That's my assumption. Uh, we also tracked in terms of the edge. Oh, wait. sorry. Uh, we also tracked in terms of the education. Uh, we looked at any master's degree, MBA, PhD, and legal degrees, because those are the ones for which we had an N of 50 or higher. Um, we looked at accounting, architecture, medical, public health policy, public health, um, and other things, but none of them were, were, there weren't enough of those people, like with the non-binaries, to make any statistical assumptions. Uh, this is, again, one of these over and underrepresented in the top categories. Um, MBA, yeah, that's useful, starting a company. I, speak, I teach at a lot of business schools once. I say things like this, this may be why. Uh, and PhD is most useful, but generally having an advanced degree seems to help, except an MBA, which doesn't hurt, it doesn't help. All right, any questions about the data I just presented? Any questions from Kenya? Who can't see you, so I don't know you're shaking your head. And I was, I'm really interested in the that longevity piece. I don't know if you can dive a little bit deeper into, especially when you were talking about, I think it was, you said all female teams don't do as well over a longer period of time versus all male teams. Was that correct? Or that was- Yep, this 79%. Mm -hmm. Do you have any information as to why that might be, or is it just- No, just so longevity ago? is years in business since they were part of our program. Um, and we, uh, that is the one piece of data that doesn't run all 10 years because we need at least five years since they came in in order to start judging. So the, the 2017 and 2018 aren't part of that set because you can't really, 
count that, right? Um, and we're, if anyone out there has a solution to the COVID issue of like how you do data consistency across COVID, because like I said, you know, giving somebody a high score and being wrong because they, we thought that customers would leave their homes to go buy their product um, is something that doesn't really fit into our model. And we're trying to figure that out. I'm sure everybody's dealing with that in some way. Um, I don't know. It's so some of these, like, this is what is, this is what is amongst almost 800 companies, right? So, and the, you know, one or 200 all female teams and the number of years in business. Why? Some of them I can, I can make assumptions. I don't know. Um, yeah. Families, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, uh, hires is interesting. Um, that was sort of unexpected. Hires and funds raised tend to track in a way that revenue and longevity tend to track, except on this chart. Uh, so because for early stage companies, less than 10 years old, if you have a massive number of hires, you probably raised external funds. And revenue and longevity, if you're still running your own company in five or 10 years, you're probably a solid revenue and you're probably around for a long time, um, but you might not have raised money. Like people who bootstrap tend to be around longer. They don't, make, they don't have as many funds raised, but their revenue does okay. Any other questions? Also to Ian, and I don't know if this is further along in your presentation, but there, you, you and I have had this conversation about success of companies, you know, boot, bootstrapping versus getting investment over the long term, which ones perform well, which ones don't. Um, I don't know if you're going to cover that a little bit more in depth further along, but I always thought that was really interesting because like, I feel like the entrepreneurs I have worked with become it's sort of like that gold standard of success to like run, you know, raise a series A or series B or whatever. Okay, yeah. But but also there's an argument that you shouldn't have to necessarily get funds to be successful, but I don't know if your data has shown anything in there. Uh, that there's not, um, you know, I could probably extrapolate that from the data I now have, although not on this call right now, but that's a really good question. Write that down in the notes and I'll, I'll, I'll dig that up for you because I am a huge opponent of the fetishization of venture capital in this country. I was recently on stage with one of the guys from Shark Tank. He seemed a pretty nice guy, but I had sort of mixed feelings about it because like so many people try and raise money that shouldn't just make money, just, you know, sell your thing to a customer. Um, yes, some industries need an influx of cash to get started but not nearly as many as you see people going for. Um, though there is also some class bias in that because, you know, starting a company uh, when you don't have a stable income otherwise is something that people of a certain income level can do. You don't have to be rich. You can be middle class and spend three months working without a salary to start a company to see if it works, but other people can't. So, but there's a whole mix on that. All right, and then we flipped and we looked at a lot of the same information about the reviewers and how accurate they were because the reviewers give the scores and then we see how successful the companies are and we tracked who were the top, uh, easy, thankfully for my math, in that window, exactly 500 reviewers reviewed five or more plans through our program, which made my math easier. So these, these, these percentages were simple. Um, and so we looked at that set of folks with pretty much the same thing we looked at the entrepreneurs at. We also looked at the US based or not US based. Had they been CEOs? Were they professional investors? Some of the standard stuff. And had they been past participants in our program? Uh, we tracked a bunch of other things like the various degrees we talked about before, non binaries, but there, none of them were large enough groups to make sense on a chart that mattered. Highlights, um, people who've been CEOs were under, uh, so the big highlight is it's easier to group people who can spot failure than to group people who can spot success. So I can give you, and I'm about to give you a whole bunch of categories of folks who are better at spotting companies that will fail. There aren't very many categories of folks other than people in the exact industry 
who are better at spotting companies that will do well. To flip what I think is the Tolstoy quote, happy companies are happy in their own, usually fairly innovative ways, and happy and successful, uh, happy and successful. Uh, sad and failing companies are failing predictable patterns. One of the things we've definitely seen, I don't think it's on one of my charts, but that age and experience, and we don't necessarily track just chronological age, but number of years doing this kind of work is what we track. Um, gray beards like me are more useful at spotting companies that will do poorly. We are not worse, but we are not better than young folk at spotting companies that will do well, unless we're in the exact industry. And this is, this is uh, because failures is predictable patterns. Oh, hey, what do you know? Welcome, Effie. Okay, so things we looked at are folks who review the business plans um, in, with the goal of getting a better set of reviewers, finding more accurate reviewers who like for Echo and Green, who are the people that when we review that are the ones who give the high scores to the, the folks who turn out well, right? I assume you have some version of that, this is ours. Um, being a CEO, not so helpful in, in the upside, very helpful in noticing the downside. Professional investors, uh, highly represented in spotting fails, slightly underrepresented in wins. Um, the only group that was slightly better at picking companies that do well were past participants, were entrepreneurs who were still in their industries, were still building their companies. Although they were often assigned companies that were doing what they're doing, but in different markets. So they, they knew the industry well. Women outperform men in every category, again, uh, most significantly in their ability to spot companies that would go on to fail, slightly in their ability to spot winners. Um, folks, we, we have a problem with the MCM that we've been working for years to address in that two thirds of our entrepreneurs are not based in the US and two thirds of our reviewers are. This is because we tend to recruit reviewers in person um, and we're US based. Um, but uh, the folks not in the US were much better at spotting companies that were going to fail. Again, we looked for people who were better at spotting wins. We didn't find a lot of them. We found a lot of specific groups that were better at spotting fails, though. Uh, lawyers did better in all categories, um, which is an improvement. Used to be they just did better at spotting fails because in the US, a legal education is basically risk assessment. Um, I don't. My, the lawyers that I admit to having don't tell me if what I'm going to, if what I'm doing is illegal. They tell me how somebody else could mess with me if I do it, if I don't do it in their exact way. Um, MBAs, uh, again, not so useful. Um, and doctorates outperformed in every category, but we, but doctorates, there's a selection bias because doctorates tend to be working in their industry. That, the Santa score. So one of the things that we did is if some of our reviewers love everything, we have some reviewers who are just cheerful, who want to give everybody fives. And their ability to spot winners, if they give everybody a high score, we don't really know if they're actually being accurate. They're just being optimistic. Some of our reviewers, particularly many of the investors, tend to give a lot of low scores because they take the, we would not invest in this seriously. That doesn't mean they dislike the companies. They're just, they're probably, they're not great inflation people. And so if they spot a fail, but they gave everybody a low score, not useful data. So we took the average degree of optimism or pessimism compared to the other folks who read the same plan in the same year, because many of our plans came in different years or different processes. Um, and we subtracted that from their, essentially their win and their loss identification percentages. So if somebody loved everything, they're not necessarily gonna show up in the top 50 pick winners because they had to, they had to love the companies that won more than the average reviewer who read that same company. Much like when I had a long definition of what we call race, um, the average 
optimism or pessimism compared to the other reviewers in the same cohort, it got shortened to naughty or nice. And that obviously got shortened as you, this graphic actually shows up, as you can see, to Santa. So the Santa score is their average optimism or pessimism compared to the other reviewers, the same company at the same time. Uh, we, we found that this is a great tool for identifying who's actually good at what they're doing. Because some people just love everybody. So looking at the reviewers, um, as you can see 100% would be the average uh, for, for folks who have joined us. Uh, what we're doing here is we're taking the sample of the occurrences in the top 10% of accuracy at spotting failures and successes, comparing it to the entire set of 773 and seeing whether these particular groups are over or underrepresented. Um, so if it's under 100%, they are less represented than we would have expected. If it's within 95 to 105, it doesn't matter. The, the statistical significance. If it's between, if it's over 120 or under 80, it matters. Um, so investors, not ugh, sorry, not so good at spotting successes. Um, past participants, uh, and again with the women, the only sort of universally successful uh, women and PhDs. Well, I don't know if there's a difference of women PhD. I should look at the women versus male PhDs is going to be too small of sample size. Um, and again, with the um, apparently my whole program is to ding on MBAs as entrepreneurs and reviewers. Um, but the MBA is the single largest is the single most common degree in our 1,200 reviewers. Uh, probably five or 600 of them have MBAs. So that's real data. Um, lawyers sort of universally good, although it's a smaller number. Um, and these are all adjusted for the Santa score. Any questions about this? Oh, good. This chart made it too. Um, this tiny little chart that was bigger uh, shows that we're getting better at predicting the success or failure of the companies over time. And part of that is we looked at reviewers over time and who reviewed with us multiple years because of our, 12, of our 1,200 reviewers, 120 of them review 90% of the time. Another four or 500 review maybe once a year on average, and then the other five or 600 review only if we have the exact right company for them. So it's really an active group of about 500. Um, and a lot of those folks are, uh, are recidivists. They review with us pretty much every cycle. And uh, starting in about the fifth cohort that you review with us, going up until about the 15th, um, there's two or three cohorts a year. People get on average five to ten percent, depending on other factors, better at spotting companies will do well or poorly. So you know, you can get better at assessing companies reviewing with us. I assume this is because they get to see the feedback of the other reviewers. And they get to see what other really smart people had to say, which I find helpful. Um, we looked at the assigned score of the that we assigned a score versus the eventual company success. Uh, this is the overall score. Uh, no significant over or under representation from all of our groups. Women slightly better again. Um, for about six years, we asked variations of would you be friends with this person? Uh, something I call the bro challenge. Uh, this is me and some of my bros a uh, very long time ago. Um, I look about the same. Um, and um, one of the people in that picture invented adopt an acre for, for those of you in the environmental space. Um, and uh, uh, we asked, would you be friends? Would you do share values? Do you like, what do you have in common? Would you feel that you have something in common with this entrepreneur? Because we wanted to make sure that people weren't overrepresenting people that they liked as people. We're happy to connect them, but, and turns out, no. Uh, six years, thousands of responses. This whole, this whole piece of it was designed by Professor Matt Lee out of Harvard, um, who, who worked with us on a couple of other pieces, but this was his main piece. He added it to the forum um, and no correlation or almost not slight one in the values, but it's uh, so whether or not they would like the entrepreneur, not relevant to a reviewer has four ways they can offer support. Uh, they can 
value it highly by giving it a high score. They can offer to be mentors. They can spend more time on and with the entrepreneur. And, um, and the fourth one will come up in a minute. Um, or three, I guess. That's it. Oh, and they can choose the company out of selection. Uh, and so we looked at the level of support offered by it and connected it to that, and there wasn't. Okay, uh, and this is what I just said. Uh, we're not investors. We don't have cash money. Um, the resources we're distributing are the scores, time spent engaged, actual engagement, offer to be a mentor. Um, at the end of our review form, the most important question says, uh, do you want to be a mentor? Do you want to have a call? Can you answer questions or do you want to stay anonymous? Uh, less than the past several years, do you want to stay anonymous? It's 5% or fewer, but we have to offer it because as I mentioned at the beginning of this call, if you say to someone, do you want to be a mentor? Their answer is, I'd love to, but I'm busy. So when we ask people to be reviewers, that is their only commitment. 95% of them sign their names, open themselves up to becoming one-time experts or mentors. Many of those folks do but their only commitment, we are clear on their commitment so that we can engage them. Um, one of our internal success measures is that more and more folks are moving up that chain. In other words, we're getting higher percentages of people offering a mentor and having conversations over the years. And that's one of the things we track because that's our success goal. Ah, bias. So we also wanted to see, in a, sorry, I don't know why uh, for the, our new audience, I don't know why um, the graphics aren't showing, but they're not. Um, we wanted to track to see if there was any bias by our reviewers against certain kinds of entrepreneurs. So we looked at all the reviews and we looked at the groups um, by education, by gender, by location, by age, by what have you. Um, adjusted it by the census score. And we compared it to the three things that I just talked about, amount of time spent on a company, uh, mentor engagement, and uh, assigned score. For the most important category for mentor engagement, we found no bias across the board, no, no statistical significance. Uh, this is our main resource and it appears to be fairly distributed and I am glad. We found a few moderately significant biases in the assignments of scores, which means certain sets of people over or underweighted certain other sets of people. Uh, most were small but amusing sample sizes. So for some reason, lawyers and PhDs do not like each other. Don't know why. Um, but that's like an N of like 20, so it doesn't really count. Um, so, but looking at pairings where there are more than 500 people involved, we found three exceptions. 700 reviews where both the reviewer and the lead entrepreneur had MBAs. There was a 10% discount. So MBAs, apparently, not so keen on other MBAs. Maybe they know how much the MBA is worth. Uh, 547 reviews where the reviewers were women and the companies had mixed gender leadership teams. There was a 20% discount. So this is an, an expectation of success and how much lower they were than the actual success on average. Um, okay, I don't know what that's about. Uh, and then the troubling one was in almost 800 reviews uh, by U.S. non-people of color against U.S. people of color. Because remember, we don't do this internationally because what's a, what's a non, what is race outside of the culture that we understand? So we don't make claims to that. Um, and also we looked in there, we, we could do U.S. non-U.S. And so we did non-U.S. and there wasn't, um, yeah. Uh, the... 85% of the reviews, they, there was an underweighting of 15%, which means that basically US white folks underweighted the eventual success of US non white folks. Um, we think, we hope desperately, because there was no one individual that stood out that did this dramatically. Because I went looking for like people who were causing problems and doing this repeatedly. We hope this is because more of our entrepreneurs of color in the US are earlier stage because some partnerships we have working with. Uh, African-American entrepreneurs in Baltimore and in, uh, in New York City and some other places. Uh, but we are investigating that correlation. But it does not happen internationally. It's about the U.S. Any questions about any of that? So bias, reviewer accuracy, all of that.
Uh, so this we, is. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So basically, what the data, if I'm understanding correctly, is saying that people, in terms of the bias that you're looking for, it's more so on this over the long term success of a company that people are rating them on, or is there more to the bias that you're seeing? That's it. So the important thing, there was no bias. The important thing is, were they offering to be mentors? Were they offering to be supportive? Were they spending time and engaging and being on calls? And so we track like how many calls, because we give them opportunities to be on various calls. Like we track essentially how engaged. When I say mentors and reviewers, they're both interchangeable and not interchangeable. They are the same people, but they're different distinct roles. Everybody's reviewer. Some people become mentors out of any given cohort, right? Because it's the dual opt-in choose each other um, so we, the important thing to us was, was anybody not offering their support to people not like them or to people like them. And that wasn't happening. What was happening was some people in the U.S. were underweighting, in other words, their expectation of success of the companies they were reviewing was significant, statistically, not significantly, 85% of 100, so, but beyond the 10% notice, because this is 782 reviews, so it's enough numbers, um, of what the other people thought they would do. So if 20 people or 30 people looked at a company and there's an average score and a set of people are consistently under that average score, those people are underweighting it compared to the other reviewers at the same time and independent of their, of their Santa score and the eventual success or failure of the company. So we remove a lot of them. There's, there's, there's heavy math in this, which I'm happy to show people, but we don't have that kind of time. Uh, if anyone wants to talk to me later. Um, uh, but I'm, I was trying to be transparent and this is what we found. Uh, the logo that's missing here says internal success. So we are a program whose major input output outcome, our major output is conversations, right? We connect adult humans to help each other out. What's our outcome? How do we know? And because we're agnostic in terms of industry and country, as mentioned earlier, different industries in different countries widely varying in terms of number of people employed, revenue. Uh, so we, we started with the most basic one, still in business. So when we look at companies, we, um, we have four categories. Uh, one is they should, never should have applied. And please, the people at grantsforyourbusiness.com, take us off your freaking list. Um, and because we don't do grants and we get applications that are clearly, I, I feel bad for the entrepreneurs because they wasted time filling out our form. Um, not Equin Green time, but you know, still time. Um, and, uh, but that's not wasted if you're the right company. Um, or even if you're in the secondary. Sorry, that came out wrong. Anyways. Uh, and then we get folks who will eventually be qualified for us, but there, there's not enough there there. There's not enough to the business plan for us to get feedback. They're not far enough along or what have you. Uh, then we get folks we would take if we had space. Every cohort depends on uh, our fundraising model is a little bit unusual. We, uh, we white label other people's events because we've been doing this for 20 years. So we're the back end to a lot of corporate social enterprise arrangements. Um, and so our cohorts vary widely in size, depending on whether or not we have a sponsor and what else we're working on. So they're always at least 10 or 12 because we need enough diversity to keep the mentors engaged. And sometimes they're 30 when they're 10 or 12, but we get enough applicants that we could take 30. We mark the folks we would have taken if we'd had this space. And then we compare them starting three years later with the folks we did take to see who's still in business. The comparison is always year by year. So the 2014s with the 2014s. Because right, when you're doing still in business, you can't really compare folks who started at different times. Um, the MCN alumni are 32% more likely to still be in business today. Um, this means that you can order their product or service on the web or by phone or something. Um, that, was the, that was our standard. It's a pretty simple standard. But as noted, I feel uncomfortable using revenue because like, that would mean matching everybody. There aren't large enough numbers to match Companies in Nigeria in agriculture that we did and did not take in 2014, because that's going to be like four and two, right? Like that's not statistically relevant. So we had to find a number to lump everybody together. And that was, are they still in business? Uh, any questions on this? Uh, one of my favorite 
uh, random stats, which is unfortunately only good for us and really 20 people, is that there are 20 companies who entered our program in multiple years, including three of our most successful companies. So they are 502% more successful because there's three outliers in that group. So, but it's a fun stat. Um, back to the roots, Tala and one of the other big ones. Um, and then 17 other companies that did fine, but you know, people who know how to use programs like ours and Equin Green and Village Capital tend to have more success measures. They know what they want to get out of it. Although there are also people who are resume hopping um, and people who need, who can't afford to travel and getting other people to pay for their travel. So there's a whole set of things behind that. Okay. Um, that is the end of the data side. And then I have a whole bit about best practices and mentorship, which we do or do not need to go into. Um, questions, thoughts? Yeah, I think this is really interesting. I, I didn't realize when we started how similar our, our fields really are with the selection process. Um, I am not in the, the investments department is the one who does, who runs the search and selection program. So I support with the events, but um, I'm, I'm not as privy to the data that we collect. Um, but what stood out to me when you were talking about um, white US based reviewers underweighting um, entrepreneurs of color. That's something that we really focus on. And, and right now we're transitioning to focusing on racial equity versus before we had climate and black male achievement and global. Um, anyways, uh, Echoing Green did a, a report with Bridgespan called um, Barriers to Capital, I believe. And it talks about uh, race at face value isn't necessarily like what will raise a flag, but race, it are, that is a, a systemic indicator in the US, of course, to so many other things. And like you're saying, if in statistically companies, investors are so risk adverse um, and people of color have less, like you said, um, I, I don't like cash on hand, I don't know the, the, the business term for that, but less cash on hand to start a company, less experience, um, potentially less educa formal education, which all of those indicators or data shows are show likely uh, markers of success. And so for me, that racial lens is interesting because it's not just, race isn't just a category against education and financing and teams, it's, it's across the whole board. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's interesting how that data kind of goes in a, a circle to, to prove itself again and again. So one of the things that I find so valuable about programs like Echoing Green and the work I get to do at MCN and the work that other folks are doing is there are endless repetitions of essentially 90, depending on how you frame it, 95 to 98% of venture and private equity capital goes to people who look like me. I mean, they're not as good looking, but you know, they, they share my basic Colin and I are the, are the, are the, the archetype, right? Um, visually. Um, and, uh, but that's a statistical trick because the, they're counting the total sum of venture capital, right? And so 90% of venture capital goes to people who've already raised 10 million when you're counting it like that. So what we need to, or five, now there's some number, it's somewhere between five and 10 million. So like, cause you know, you give Mark Zuckerberg a billion dollars and that just swamps every other person, right? Like, so that's a vast quantity. So what we need to do is get people to the five, 10, $20 million level, um, cause that'll break it. Like if we want to give a hundred million to somebody, I'd rather find 20 people and get them to the 10 million part so that they can play for the bigger money, which is what Echo and Green has been helping with, which is what we've been helping with, is what, um, you know, so a lot of folks are helping with. Because if you get people to the phase where they've shown that the business works, um, I'm in the, what I call the 1080-10 school, which is with most social issues, 10% of the people are being a problem, 80% of the people are just doing what's easy and lazy, and 10% of the people are trying to find the solution actively. So um, this may be a little bit defensive as a middle-aged white man from the United States and middle class who went to a fancy school, um, but you know, my people are, are lazy. Speaking for my entire race and class, as I'm often called to do, my people are lazy. Um, those of you who are not from the US, that's a joke based on what we often make people who don't look like me do. Um, <laughs> um, and so if we make something, they'll, they'll do what's easy, right? And if you make it easy to reach people, now there's still some percentage that are gonna be active problems. That's a different solution, like getting them new jobs. 
But for most people, if you make it easy, if you find the business solution, and that's what I hope we're doing, right? Getting people to the point where they can show business operations because it's de-risking, right? We're de-risking the cultural variable. To us, the cultural variable is a positive. To other people, the cultural variable is a risk. It's a variable. We should de-risk it. And how can we best do that? Now, that's, the top, that's, the, that's probably the title of my next talk, de-risking the cultural variables. Uh, any questions or comments from the other folks? Uh, I think that's one comment from me. I'm enjoying the conversation so far. And yeah, coming into the talk, I um, hadn't anticipated. Um, oh, it's, it's basic, what I'm basically just trying to say is uh, appreciate the rigor within which you proceed this, uh, the amount of data you've collected over the years. And as I said, in just trying to de risk um, some of this, uh, especially like early stage investments, um, just trying to get these uh, companies to grow um, to be the size and scale. Uh, some of the more, uh, what, you'd give, what you'd say, like just typical companies uh, that you'd find um, along those lines. So yeah, very much uh, appreciate that. Thank you. I mean, what I'm most hoping to do with this data is get this out there because we use it, right? We use it for our program. When we notice that this is a more important aspect for success, we put more resources into that. Right? When we notice that certain people are being underrepresented, we go find more people like that. Right? This is almost all of this is actionable data for somebody who is supporting social entrepreneurs, or even it's for most of it for entrepreneurs in general. Um, and a lot of it is things that we feel that we know, like older women have a harder time than older men. Any woman I've ever said that to is like, yeah, well, duh. But I'm like, but did you, but like, here are eight, you know, here's a comparison amongst a set of 800. <laughs> Right, here's data that you can use next time says you're making that up and not having to go to you know Meryl Street versus Harrison Ford examples. I wonder how, in, in terms of the people using your data, I feel like if they're socially inclined like your organization, our organization and, and within this network and this call, um, I think we would have our opinions of, of obviously if, if that's the case then we want to diversify the pool and um, correct that bias against women over the age of 37, for example. But I think other, I, my experience with other for-profit venture capital, like traditional venture capital firms, um, might look at the data and say people with higher education um, from Ivy League schools tend to perform better, let's focus on them, which only perpetuates that like diversity issue. Um, have you found, um, or, or do you interact with the people who use your data and, and how they actually interpret it? Because data can be interpreted whichever way you want to present it. So, um, yeah, so this is the story of the data at the beginning, which makes this is the information, right? Information is the story of data. We present it in different ways. Um, anyone I know who has actively used this information has been working with social enterprise because that's the people I've specifically reached out to. Um, one of the, but I'm trying to make the business case for the 80%, right? Where, so one of the things, one of the reasons we chose for-profits rather than non-profits is because if you do a thing that uh, treats your people better, treats your supply chain better, de-risks the environment, reduces your turnover, whatever, and it makes the world a better place and it makes you more or didn't lose you money, other people are happy to, like, happy to do it. But a lot of these things are long-term plays. If they were short-term plays, we wouldn't have to fight for them, right? They're long-term plays. People, and, and this is folks who do the real data. So if any entrepreneur comes to me and says, 88% of, or whatever percent of young people, whatever young people is like, and I've been hearing this for 30 years, will pay more for a green product. No, they effing won't. 15 to 18% tops. 88% say they will. I mean, that was the last one I saw. It's, it's always between 16 and 80%, but depending on you know, whatever. Um, so you want to find, you know, because a business, you know, if a business is, um, we have something we call the charisma limit. A lot of the social entrepreneurs we work with meet with more initial success than they expect, and they think it's going to be easier than it is, because in the beginning, there are people who buy their product 
because they believe in the entrepreneur or the cause. And I don't mind lifestyle businesses if you're making a tiny little thing that does good for the world and it's a thing you do on the side, fine, whatever. But like, that's not going to be a model for other people, right? Um, unless they can afford to do something in their spare time. Um, so we want folks that are going to scale so they can be models, not scale so they can go to private equity, which is, you know, they can if they want. Some of our companies have. But, and, um, wait, I've lost my thread here. There was a point. Um, Oh, crap. What was the example? Um, oh, the Chris moment. Uh, but eventually, these folks hit a limit where they need to be a product market fit, right? It doesn't matter that they're cool. The 15% of people who will pay slightly more or go out of their way for it because it's cool or whatever the version is stops sooner than people think it does because some of them buy into the whole 80% thing. Um, a handful of examples. Everybody's got examples of people who broke that mold. Fine. You know but not everybody gets to be Steve Jobs or Ben and Jerry or, or, or what have you, or Anita Roddick or Eileen Fisher or whatever, right? Um, and yes, there are examples, um, but most folks, it stops at a certain point and we try to find these people and say, okay, here are the hardcore business problems, but we're unlike other advisors, we're not gonna ask you to like, all right, you gotta stop doing this green thing or this long-term employee retention thing or whatever. Although the one set of numbers that is real and significant uh, from a statistical point of view is that employee retention at cool, whatever that means, social, environmentals, diverse, however you want to take it, companies is a significant factor, but for white collar jobs. So folks who are making a hundred grand a year when they could be making 150 are, it's a pretty significant bit that if you love where you work, this is all pre-COVID when no one doesn't know what that happens. You will stay at a company compared to a place that you might think of as soulless that's going to pay you, I think it's 23% more. Like that was what they found. And that impacted massive research on this. So for employers, this matters. But the trick is this only starts at the uh, one, uh, one sigma above mean um, in the U.S. about $110,000 a year, roughly. Um, sorry, I speak in things like one sigma above me. Um, it's, uh, but for, um, but for blue collar jobs, actually trade jobs make a lot of money, uh, for, for folks making less money than that and whatever their equivalent is, it's not as relevant because if, if, you know, the amount of money you need, you need, you need, as opposed to you want, then how cool your company is matters less. But if you reach the point where you want more money, but you don't need more money, then people will choose the cooler company, the more responsible company, but those are the higher salary jobs. Um, so, you know. and this isn't, in case you're in New York City, $110,000 is a lot of money outside of New York City. <laughs> um, Still a lot for me too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, other questions? We have about five minutes. Sarah, you got any closing or? No, just to thank you for your time and expertise and all this data. I mean, it's a huge swath over a long, really long period of time. So it's really valuable. Um, and it's going to be a huge, I mean, it is a huge value resource. And I love that you share all of this too on your website. So just wanted to reiterate that this information is, uh, the data is available on your website as well. Um, and if there aren't any other questions, we can give the five minutes back to people and, and just end. Sarah, if you've got a few minutes, I'd love to chat with you directly. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.